This true scary workplace story occurred in the autumn of 2012 in Glasgow, Scotland. The light was fading as it was the evening and there was a chill in the air. My two friends, let's call them Neelam and Aisha, worked in a beauty salon in the West End area of the city and were just closing up for the evening when a group of three men wearing ski masks came in carrying blue shopping bags. The men were screaming and asking where the owner of the salon was to which they both replied that they didn't know. Although both of the girls were scared, they thought the men seemed fairly amateurish. Then suddenly they pulled out hammers and silver duct tape. The men then marched Neelam and Aisha to the back area of the salon where they wrapped their hands and mouths with the duct tape. They then debated on what to do next. Wait for the owner? Or leave? Thankfully, they decided on the latter but not before they smashed the cash register and some mirrors with their hammers. Surprisingly, the men didn't actually steal anything. They then left the salon and left Neelam and Aisha taped up and gagged out back. The girls struggled for quite a while to free themselves from the tape, but they eventually managed to use a pair of hairdressing scissors to free their hands and remove the duct tape from their mouths. The whole incident only realistically lasted for about 20 minutes, although for them it felt much, much longer. Thankfully, the girls were not hurt. However, they were both very shaken up for a long time after this, and the men were never caught as far as they were aware. Both of my friends quit the salon immediately following this, and they never found out what those men wanted with the owner and they're grateful she wasn't there. As if she had been, things might have been much, much worse. One day while I was eating dinner at home, I heard a knock on the door. When I went outside, I saw a middle-aged woman holding a small doll. There was something creepy about that doll. Its hair was a few short strands, its face was frowning and grotesque, and its skin was as realistic as a real person's skin. The lady looked at me and she screamed, Give me something to eat! Anything! Uh, I'm a vegetarian, so the only thing I can give you is bread. Would you like that too? She nodded her head, and I brought her the bread. Then she snatched the bread and stuffed it into the mouth of the doll she was holding. The doll's mouth was quite large and seemed to have a lot of space inside. It was as if the bread was being sucked into it. I looked at her with a confused expression and she said, She eats everything. She'll probably eat your face off too. <laughs> then she put her ear to her doll's mouth and after a moment she suddenly said, She wants meat. She says the bread is not delicious. I was horrified and just closed the door. Then she shouted from outside the door, Babies need to eat protein to grow taller! A few days later, there was another knock on the door and when I looked out the window, she was standing at my front door, holding her doll. The doll looked different. It appeared to have grown in size and its hair had grown longer. The frown was less prominent than before, but it was still a creepy face. I was unsure whether it was the same doll as before or a different doll, and I wanted to look at it more closely. I opened the door and handed her a sandwich. She fed the sandwich to her doll. I looked closely at the doll. Teeth that weren't there before had grown, and it looked as if the doll was chewing the sandwich. I thought to myself, is this a doll designed to have jaws that move automatically? Is it just my imagination? I felt an inexplicable, unpleasant feeling rush over me and I closed the door. The president of the company that made that doll must have been controlled by an evil spirit, I muttered to myself as she continued to feed the doll outside the house. From that day on, she kept coming to my house, but I stopped answering the door because looking at that doll gave me goosebumps all day. After a few days, I was used to ignoring her knocks. Then, one night, I woke up startled when I heard a child's angry voice outside the front door. I checked the time. It was 3 a.m., and I was irritated. I carefully looked out the window. 
in the darkness, I saw the woman standing, holding the hand of a doll that was bigger than before. This time, the doll was standing on the ground. The doll's face had a severe frown. The woman knocked on the door and screamed. My child wants to eat soup with me right now! Then she tried to open the window of my house. Damn, I'm a vegetarian! I was so angry that I screamed at her, and then she disappeared. The next day, as I was passing through the neighborhood, I noticed a police line had been placed on my neighbor's house. I asked a local resident standing there what was going on, and what he said was shocking. You know the woman who carries a doll and begs every day? She killed the man who lived in this house. However, the method of murder was a um, bit bizarre. The man's stomach was cut open with the doll's fingernails. The police said the doll's fingernails were sharp as knives. What's even more shocking is that she made soup with the flesh of the man's corpse. When the police asked why she did such a thing, she said that her baby's favorite food was human soup. He pointed to the doll that was lying at the scene as he explained. The doll was so heavy that when the police cut open its stomach, they found a bunch of soup inside. However, they said there were things inside the doll's stomach that looked like intestines, and they were as realistic as real intestines. The police said they couldn't figure out where the doll was made. They said they had never seen such a doll in their lives, and that it was made of an unknown material other than plastic. I froze on the spot. I looked at the doll. It was bigger than when it came to my house the night before. Its hair was long and thick. Its teeth and fingernails were like blades and it had a faint smile on its face. I quickly returned home, and for several days I had terrible nightmares about the doll eating my flesh. I later learned the woman's story. She was homeless at the time, and someone had left the doll next to her, so she carried it around with her, thinking it was her baby. People thought she was crazy, but no one has figured out who made the doll, who gave it to her, or how it grew. I'm Arjun, and this is my story. This happened a few months ago. I'm a guy just out of college and was searching for a job. During that time, I was living with my parents in one of the big cities in South India. My parents had to go out to meet a friend of theirs, leaving me alone in the house, and I was sort of spooked because the night before I had watched one of the scariest horror movies. My house has two floors. My room and the bathroom is upstairs. They left early and I got ready to get into the shower. I had the weird habit of playing loud music when I take a bath, but this time my phone was low on battery, so I charged it and switched on YouTube to play music on my TV. Before I went into the bathroom, I flipped on the light switch, which was outside the room. A few minutes passed after I got in the shower. I was bathing and enjoying the music when suddenly the bathroom light turns off. I ignored it, thinking it might be because of a power outage. But then my mind started to wonder, if this is a power outage, why the heck is the TV still playing music? I could feel knots in my stomach as I thought of the possible reasons why the light bulb went off. There was no way the problem was with the bulb because it was recently replaced. But then that meant someone had switched it off from outside. I got out of the shower, wrapped my towel around my waist, and had my hand on the doorknob. When suddenly, I heard the sound of the switch being flipped and the light in the bathroom came back on. By this point, I was trembling in fear. I peeked out the door and shouted, Hello? Mom? Dad? Are you guys back? But there was no answer. Then, I heard the sound of some plates being thrown down on the floor below from the kitchen. I reminded myself that I'm an adult now, and I gathered my courage and decided to go check what was happening. I let the music on the TV continue playing loudly for additional courage. Then I reached the top of the stairs. I slowly peeked from the top of the stairs to the floor below. There I saw some plates and utensils on the floor, but I couldn't see anyone. The rational part of my mind started coming up with explanations, like that it could have all been a coincidence. Once I had been watching for a minute or so and couldn't see anyone, I walked down the remaining stairs, checked all through the floor, including the closets, and even made sure the back door to the house was locked. I was about to relax, thinking I was just getting paranoid, when suddenly the music playing upstairs stopped. 
and heavy footsteps started coming from the stairs like someone was walking down them. I couldn't just stand there and wait to see who it was, so I ran. I ran outside the house wearing just my towel and waited near the gate of my house without even my phone. Almost an hour later, my parents returned and I told them what happened, but obviously they thought I was just pranking them. When we went back into the house, I was alert, expecting an attack from anywhere, but nothing happened. Then my mom scolded me for being irresponsible and leaving the back door to the house open. I almost fainted when she said that because I'm dead certain that it was locked when I was looking around earlier. To this day, I still wonder what would have happened if I had waited to see the person coming down the stairs. I never want to know the answer because I'm sure something bad would have happened to me by whoever or whatever it was that turned off the bathroom light. Hi, my name is Estefania, but I prefer to be called Tefa. I'm from Honduras, a small Central American country known for its urban legends or stories, whatever you want to call them. However, my experience is completely different from what is told throughout the country. This happened two weeks ago. It was a Thursday night. I took out the trash because the garbage truck came on Friday morning. It was late, around 2 a.m., and I got out through the back door. To be clear, it is a glass door, but it is always locked. I got out with the garbage bags when suddenly I saw a man, a very tall man. He was wearing black clothes and a black hat with a red ribbon around the hat. He was facing me and I thought it was weird. So I told him, I'm sorry, sir, are you okay? Are you lost? I did not receive an answer from him. I asked him again, Sir, are you lost? Sorry, but you are in private property. You shouldn't be here. Not an answer. I started to get annoyed, so I screamed at him. Sir, if you don't leave, I'm going to have to call the police. He moved his head a little bit, but he didn't say anything. I screamed, that's it, I'm calling the police. I went inside to get my phone, and when I got back outside again, he was gone. I didn't allow it to bother me. The next morning, I decided to ask the guard about the man, whether he had seen him before, or whether we could check the cameras near my house, which is clearly part of my yard where everything happened. He played the part where I saw the man, and when I saw the video, my heart dropped. Because there was no man in the footage, I was talking by myself. The guard looked at me, confused. I thanked him and returned home. I tried not to think about it but it was the only thing that came to mind. Did I have a vision? Was it a ghost? Who was that man? When I told the story to my family members and friends, they all said the same thing. That night, I had an encounter with the devil. A few years ago, a married couple decided they needed a break and chose to go out for the night. They called their most trusted babysitter, the two kids were sound asleep in bed when the babysitter arrived, so the babysitter just got to sit around and make sure everything was okay with the children. Later that night, the babysitter became bored and went downstairs to watch TV, but she couldn't because there was no cable downstairs. The couple didn't want their children to watch too much garbage. So she called them and asked them if she could watch cable in their room upstairs. Of course, the couple agreed. But the babysitter had one last request. She asked if she could cover up the angel statue outside the bedroom window with a blanket or cloth because it made her nervous. The phone line was silent for a moment, and the father, who was talking to the babysitter at the time, said, Take the children and get out of the house. We'll call the police. We don't own an angel statue. The police found both of the children and the babysitter slumped in pools of their own blood within three minutes of the call. No statue was found. My name is Charles. I was 18 when this story happened, and I was living in Texas, USA. Me and my girlfriend Amanda were taking a walk down the street and enjoying a date. However, while we were walking, I felt like someone was watching us. 
I didn't think much of it though. After we got home, Amanda and I were planning a trip to go and have a fun time. After talking and getting drunk, we were making out, and when out of the corner of my eye, I could see a human shadow in my living room window, about five meters away from me. This scared me terribly, and because I was drunk, I just continued kissing my girlfriend. However, the shadow didn't move, and suddenly, beside the shadow, I saw a flash. The creep must have taken a photo. Being inebriated, I ran outside to confront whoever it was, but what I saw next gave me chills. On the window, I saw something written in blood. It said, you're going to pay for what you did. I called the police and they investigated, but they could get nothing helpful from the evidence. A week passed and I continued to see and hear weird things like tapping on my window and human-like shadows. A while later, my girlfriend and I went on our trip. Being crazy 18-year-olds, we went to the hotel and were testing the bed that night. While we were doing that, I heard someone say outside of the door, you're going to pay. So I knew it was the creep. My girlfriend and I immediately rushed out to confront them and were terrified when we saw a man with a knife in his mouth and blood streaming down his hand. We both screamed and rushed inside. Amanda was crying, so I made out with her to calm her down, since that's what she likes, and then called the police. The police caught the guy and told us everything. What scared me the most was that it was Amanda's old boyfriend, and he was trying to kill me since I was Amanda's boyfriend now. Hello, my name is Ed. I'm from the Philippines. This story I'm about to share, it's not mine, but rather the story of my friend, Sarah. She used to work as a cashier at the SM Cebu. One night after a long shift, she decided to return to her boarding house where she lived alone. She got a text from her friends inviting her to have fun, but she refused politely. She just wanted to have some alone time. She almost shrieked when she noticed someone behind her in the window, staring at her while she was trying to organize her belongings. But she immediately had a sigh of relief when she realized it was her boyfriend. She greeted him with a big smile and motioned to him to come inside, but he didn't move. Sarah didn't understand and asked, how long have you been standing there? But she received no response. This bothered her because he was just standing there, doing nothing, but staring at her with dead eyes. A bit frustrated, she decided to go out and meet him, but when she went outside, he was no longer there. She thought he was pranking her, hiding, but how could he have hid so quickly? After all, there was no place in sight to hide. She dialed her boyfriend's number while she was searching for him, hoping to hear the loud ringtone. She knew her boyfriend would never put his phone on silent, but she heard nothing. Instead, her boyfriend's voice on the phone greeting her. She asked him where he was and to stop hiding. Confused, having no idea, he asked, What are you talking about? I am currently at home. She couldn't understand. But I just saw you staring at me just a minute ago, she replied. How is that even possible, he asked. You are aware that I would always call before visiting. This scared her, because he was right. He would always call or at least text if he were to visit. If it wasn't you, then who was I talking to? She said fearfully. She got goosebumps as she frantically looked around. Sweat began to trickle down her face. Her boyfriend answered. Sarah, it's okay. I'll be there. Just go back inside and don't open the door. I'll call you when I arrive. He hung up, and she immediately went inside, locked all the doors, windows, and started praying. A few minutes later, her boyfriend called, asking her to open the door. They embraced. He hugged her tightly and made sure she was all right. They talked about the odd situation. This also scared Sarah's boyfriend, so he decided to bring Sarah to his place to spend the night in safety. Years have passed. She is now happily married to her boyfriend. They are now also blessed with a daughter. Sarah's husband loves to play with their daughter, enjoying life, seeming as if he had forgotten everything about what had happened those years ago. Thinking back, Sarah still questions herself. What would have happened if she hadn't called him and just kept looking for that person 
who stood outside her window. A few months ago, I received a call from an unknown number. At first, I thought it was someone calling by mistake, and I ignored it, but the calls continued. One day I answered the phone and asked, who is this? A man responded, are you curious about who I am? Everyone who knows my identity will die. I angrily responded, hey, and people who prank call me, I will also kill. But he ignored me and continued talking. Come out to the front of your yard, of your house, at midnight. Then you will know who I am. I got annoyed, so I just hung up. But the calls kept coming, so I blocked the number. A few days later, I received a call from another unknown number, and I heard the same man's voice. I got angry and cussed him out. Then he said, Do not be angry. If you get angry, you'll get cancer. His prank calls continued for weeks, and eventually I got so angry that when he called one night, I immediately yelled at him. I'm going to come to you right now, and I'm going to rip off all your fingers so you won't be able to dial the phone. Oh, calm down. The human body is precious. I'm in a white van on 5th Street. Come to me. The phone suddenly hung up. No matter how much I thought about who was making the prank call, no one came to mind. I was so angry that I decided to go see the guy and show him how scary my fists could be. I called my friends, Carlos and Mason. It was at night, and these two, for a lack of better term, were tough guys, sturdy young men, if you know what I mean, who had nothing to fear. When we arrived on Fifth Street, there was no one to be seen, but there, in the middle of the street, was parked a large white van. However, the tinted windows were so dark, we couldn't see inside. We yelled at the van. Yeah, yeah. Come on. And that's when we got a call. And there and then I heard it, that familiar voice. Mm, three precious items delivered to me. I could not be more happy right now. My friends, they went to the van, pressed their faces against the windows, and tried to look inside. At that moment, a window rolled down and two muscular arms as thick as pumpkins appeared and hit Carlos and Mason in the face, causing them to fall backwards like helpless dolls. With a loud thud, they hit the ground, twisted like squids. Then the large man loaded Carlos and Mason into the van and drove off. Everything happened so quickly, as if it all happened within three seconds or so. I quickly called the police, but the van had no numbers on the license plate. The police searched for the van, but it was nowhere to be found. I was in a huge panic, and I was shaking uncontrollably all night long. The next day, I got another call from an unknown number. It was him. Oh, I was surprised. The items were in better condition than I expected. Carlos has a crystal clean liver, and Mason has very hearty, healthy kidneys. Thanks to these, I earned $100,000. Now, let's have a party. Come to me. You know the place where we met yesterday. Come at 10 o'clock tonight. Your friends, they are still here, but a little indisposed. Kind of having trouble breathing. <laughs> I started crying. I swore at him, but then he hung up. I called the police and told them about the call and the location. Then at 10 p.m., I went back to Fifth Street. However, the van that was there quickly sped off as soon as the police pulled up. They took off and chased the van. A couple hours later, I got the call. It was him. Oh, I really want those prime organs of the policemen who are following me right now. I'm sure I can sell them all. <laughs> a few days later, the police station contacted me. They told me that the police officers who had chased the van that day had gone missing. I was speechless. I was in shock. A few days later, I received a text message from an unknown number with a photo attached. 
In the photo, there were men lying on an operating table, and next to them were men wearing surgical gowns and masks, holding tens of thousands of dollars in an open briefcase. The message read, sold to police officers. I was so scared out of my mind. I begged my parents to move away, right away. My parents, they also felt the seriousness of the situation. And so within weeks, we moved away. And at the same time, I changed my phone number. I was so relieved that I was now free from those calls from that man. But one day, I saw a white van parked in front of the house I moved to. It was stopped there for some time, and then it drove off. The next day, I went to view the spot where the van was standing, and there, on the ground, was a photograph. I picked it up to get a closer look. There in the photo were two unknown people, but written on the bottom of the pic was Carlos and Mason saved two lives. The shock shook me to my core. A few weeks later, on the evening news, a report came the organ harvesters had been caught. However, the bodies of Carlos and Mason were never found. Still to this day, I continue to suffer from severe trauma. Luckily, the prank calls had stopped. But still, the inner panic was always on, 24 hours a day. Six months have passed since the incident, but what is still scary is that a van without license plates still appears in front of my house from time to time. Every time that van appears, a rotten smell emanates within the air. Police continue to search for the vans, but with no luck and no clue of identities. I no longer leave the house without extreme fear of what could happen to me. When I was in college, I had a very strange friend. These days, he's more of an enemy than a friend, but anyway, his name is Kevin. He was a fanatic who was obsessed with scorpions, and he only wore clothes with scorpions on them from head to toe. He said he kept all kinds of scorpions in his home and often brought live scorpions to school to surprise his friends. One day, I decided to go to his house with some friends to hang out, but that was the beginning of a disaster. When we arrived at his house, we were really surprised. His house was quite large, he lived alone, and there were numerous terrariums filled with scorpions. We looked at the scorpions of various sizes and colors for a while. Then Kevin asked us what we wanted to eat, and I suddenly got playful and said, I want to eat fried scorpions. Then the friends all burst into laughter, and Kevin also smiled brightly. We decided to order pizza, and after eating and playing video games, we were about to go home. As our friends were heading out, Kevin grabbed my shoulder and asked me to stay a little longer. I said okay, and my friends left first. But shortly after that, my eyesight went dark and I collapsed. When I opened my eyes, my hands and feet were tied and I was in a closed room. I screamed as loud as I could, and after a while, Kevin came running. When I swore at him and asked what he was doing, he said, My children are so angry because of what you said earlier that they are raising their tails. Look! Then he started bringing terrariums full of scorpions in front of me. Soon, dozens of various scorpions were placed in front of me, and he said, You're my friend, so I'll only sting you three times. Choose three of these scorpions. Among these children, some are very poisonous and some are only a little. Try and guess whose poison is weaker. I was livid and shouted that I would kill all of his scorpions, but he picked up one scorpion and said, Before that, think about which scorpions are not poisonous. The scorpion's tail attempted to sting me right before my eyes, and my whole body was drenched in sweat from the extreme fear. I tried to cajole him, but he wouldn't listen to me and told me that if I didn't pick a scorpion in one minute, he would pick it himself. I ended up choosing one. Then he held the scorpion against my bound hand, and the scorpion stung my hand with its tail. And then a tremendous pain came over me. I shouted out in agony. He said with a smile, It was a good choice. This child is poisonous, but not dangerously so. How is it? It's still the first round, so you can survive, right? I howled. He checked my pulse and asked me to choose the second scorpion. I hesitated, but he threatened me again by holding a scorpion in front of me, and so I ended up choosing one. 
When this scorpion stung my hand, I felt even more pain than before, and I was struggling to catch my breath. I screamed for help. Kevin said while examining my pupils, You're still okay, but that kid you just picked is a very poisonous one. It's so exciting to see people being poisoned right in front of my eyes. Please hold on and don't die. There's still one round left. I cried and screamed that I couldn't breathe, and he just laughed crazily. I begged him to save me, and he said, Such a pity, but I can't help it. There's still one more scorpion player left, so choose the last one carefully. I ended up picking one, and again the scorpion stung me, and although it hurt, there were no serious symptoms. You just picked a kid who wasn't very poisonous. You're lucky. Kevin clapped his hands and left the room, and I fainted. When I woke up, what must have been hours later, Kevin was sitting in front of me. As he handed me a wad of cash, he said, Now, here's $1,000. This is my thanks for a really fun show today. Don't even think about reporting it to the police. I would just tell them that you got stung while handling a scorpion by yourself. I nodded at him to pretend to cooperate. Then he said happily, Good, I think my kid's anger has calmed down a bit now. (laughs) He then released me and I went straight to the hospital. I managed to recover after receiving treatment. After a few days, I couldn't hold back my anger and decided to get revenge on him. So I contacted him and asked him to do the Scorpion show one more time. He obliged and asked me to come to his house. I went to his house, knocked, and as soon as he opened the door, I punched him in the face with all my might. He fell backwards and crawled towards the Scorpion terrariums. I chased him and beat him like crazy. He was so stuck in a stupor that he couldn't get up from the floor. I took a knife from his kitchen and stabbed all the scorpions to death. Kevin cried, and I returned home. After that, he didn't come to school again, and no one saw or heard from him. I don't know what he's doing now. I just hope I never run into him again. The year was 2012. I was just back home from a normal school day. My mother was dating my best friend's father at the time, so it was very common for the two of us to sleep at each other's houses. On that fateful day, my friend, who I'll call April, and I decided to have a sleepover at my house. I used to sleep with my mom, but as I got a visit from April that day, we decided to have a slumber party and sleep on the bunk bed in my brother's room. That night, we had dinner, played common games at slumber parties for teenage girls, ate popcorn, put on makeup, took pictures, etc., We decided to go to sleep around midnight, leaving the radio on, which admitted a soft blue light from the viewfinder, which lit the room slightly. April decided to sleep on the bottom bunk, and I slept on the top. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling cold, and with my back, which was facing the bedroom door, uncovered. So, I decided to turn around to pull the cover that was falling off the bed. At that same moment that I looked down and pulled up the blanket, turning back to the wall, I saw a figure. I then turned quickly to look and see what the figure was. Usually, when we quickly look somewhere and see a figure, we quickly look back at the place and see nothing. Only this time, it was there, the figure. But it was no longer a figure. It was a young-looking girl, standing there, looking at me. I remember every detail of her face. She had short, neck-length black hair. Her body was thin, extremely thin. Her skin looked a light brown tone. Her nose was thin and pointed like a model's. Her eyes were large and black. The darkness of the night made them even darker. And she was just there, standing completely still, watching me. She could have been looking at April, who was right in front of her, but no. She was staring at me with those big, dark eyes. In a moment of fright, I sat on the bed, widened my eyes and stared at her, not believing that this was real. But she just stood there, looking at me for what felt like two minutes. When she realized I can see her, she recoiled back, startled that I can see her too, and then in one quick motion, she jumped onto April's bed. I thought she was still there, that she might be doing something with April, or that she would be waiting for me to sleep again to get out of there, so I decided to look. I leaned over the bunk, 
leaning against the wood of the upper headboard, peering fearfully into the lower bunk to see where my nighttime visitor and friend were. But the only thing I could see was April sleeping peacefully. After that, I lay still for a while trying to process what had just happened until I finally managed to fall asleep. The next day, I told my mom and April what had happened and they didn't believe me. I never saw that girl again and I could never sleep in that room again. But to this day, I can clearly remember her small, lean body and her massive black eyes staring at me that night. Who was that girl? This isn't the most interesting story ever, but I thought I would send it in anyway. I'm also not using my friend's real names while telling this story. This happened only three nights ago. My friends and I always stay out really late or go out really late. This one night it was cold and raining, but we decided to go out anyway. It was me and my four other friends, Jacob, Mike, Brooke, and Abigail. Abigail and Brooke were staying at my house that night, and we decided to meet up with Jacob and Mike at the store down the road from my house. By the time we got there, we were already soaked. We were all walking to our hangout spot, which is a good 30 minute walk, and we were joking around pretty loudly the whole way. We were not even halfway there when somebody screamed at us from their car. They didn't say anything, just screamed loudly. Everyone heard the scream except for Brooke. We thought nothing of it because people driving past us at night always do that. We started to joke around about a hostage situation that happened in our town the day before and talked about how one guy got away. I didn't even know it happened, so I was pretty frightened at first, but forgot about it pretty quickly. We were still walking, laughing, and joking around ten minutes later when we heard a man yell, Shut up! at us. We turned to look behind us and saw a man in an alley across the street. We all looked at each other and none of us said anything because we didn't know what to say. The man then yelled again, People are trying to sleep! Since we were being loud, my first thought was that it was a guy who had been woken up by our yelling and such. We turned around to continue walking when he yelled again, Shut up! Brooke thought he was joking or something, so she yelled back at him, No, you shut up! As we are about to continue walking, he yells again, Who wants to talk? And he starts crossing the road to where we were. We all panicked and began running towards the nearest gas station, which wasn't too far away. The guy is running towards us, and my friend Jacob tells me to call 911, so I call them. They pick up, and I can barely hear them from our running, yelling, and the man's yelling. I tried to explain what was going on, but I didn't know how because I was so terrified. We get to the gas station and my friend Brooke takes my phone and talks to the operator. We told the guy working at the gas station what happened and luckily there were two customers in the store. My friends and I were in the store's corner near a cooler when we saw the guy walking up to the gas station door and noticed he had blood all over his shirt. The blood was coming from a wound on his head and a cut across his neck. The guy working at the gas station also calls 911, not knowing we already did. The guy starts yelling at us again, just repeating the same things. One of the customers, who's a little older, gets in front of us because the guy was trying to get closer to us and he also tried to grab onto my friend Abigail. The customer in the store tells the man, Back up right now. The guy says loudly, No, you back up or somebody's gonna get hurt. We then see a police officer pull up by the gas station door and ask what's going on. Brooke hands me back my phone and I tell the 911 operator that the cops are here. They told me to talk to the officer and hung up. The guy kept saying a bunch of random things to the officer and then two more cars pull up. Only one more officer comes in. The guy goes to the back of the store where we can only see his face. The officer asks him, Did you have anything to drink tonight? And he says, A lot. The officer then says, Walk outside so we can talk. The guy says, No, I'm not gonna. The officer then says, Well, you're under arrest then. (laughs) For what? The guy says, laughing. 
For public intoxication, put your hands behind your back. The officer says, No, the guy says, trying to leave the store. The officers grab him, and we hear something metal hit the floor. The officers arrest him, and the girl cop says, Good thing I was in the lot. She then leaves, and the guy working at the gas station tells us to wait to tell the police what happened. The police come back in, and they ask what happened. We tell the police what happened, and he says, Okay, it's the guy we were looking for anyway. Our faces drop, and we look at each other. The officer tells us we can leave now, so we go sit by a building for a while and talk about what just happened. We try and keep our minds off things, but we soon decide it's best we go home. The next day, we see a police report on Facebook talking about the guy who got arrested late that night was indeed from the hostage situation in our town. To explain the hostage situation a little more, there were three guys who held a young lady hostage. One knew he was going to get caught, and he shot himself when the SWAT team got there. One got shot by the SWAT team, and one of them got away. I won't share too much information about him, but I'll share a few things from the police report. He was 38 and from our town. He was armed when he was arrested, and that's the metal we heard drop on the ground. He attended court the next day and was charged with careless use of a firearm, unauthorized possession of a firearm, reckless discharge of a firearm, possession of a firearm while prohibited, assault, and uttering threats. I'm glad those customers were present, as well as the police officer. My friends and I could be dead right now if he had pulled out his gun.